welcome to Faith Presbyterian Church on this third Sunday of Lent. We're glad you're here. We have a few, a few brief announcements. Please take time to read the full details in your bulletins. We're having a Buildings and Grounds Workday on Saturday, April the 2nd, starting at 9 a.m. We'll be sprucing up the grounds before our Holy Week programs, including spreading mulch, pulling weeds, and light yard work as needed. Please plan to join us. We're having an Easter egg hunt and cookout on Palm Sunday, April 10th. We're asking for lots of donations of tree-filled eggs for the kiddos, plus small gift cards to have a youth egg hunt also. We'll be inviting the children from our local school and our neighboring families to attend. If you can help with lunch or activities, please sign up in the main lobby. We also have a sign up for lunch so we can start gauging members. We're taking reservations for lilies for Easter Sunday. Each lily is $10 and you may dedicate the flower to your loved one. You will find an Easter lily display in the main hallway with dedication cards. As always, lilies can be taken home after the Easter services. This afternoon, Peggy Bowman, Westerfield, will be um, installed this afternoon as, as the moderator for the Presbyterian of Greater Atlanta. And Kay Morowski will be installed as the treasurer of the PW for, uh, for the Presbyterian of Greater Atlanta. We wish them both uh, a good year and keep them in your prayers for their service and dedication. Joyful lips. 
vision and the way of Jesus. Today we'll be hearing from Susan Gilman. Today I will be reading from the New Living Translation to give us a little different interpretation of the passage from last week. This is Isaiah 58, 6 through 12. No, this is the kind of fasting I want. Free those who are wrongly imprisoned. Lighten the burden of those who work for you. Let the oppressed go free and remove the chains that bind people. Share your food with the hungry and give shelter to the homeless. Give clothes to those who need them and do not hide from relatives who need your help. Then your salvation will come like the dawn and your wounds will quickly heal. Your godliness will lead you forward and the glory of the Lord will protect you from behind. Then when you call, the Lord will answer. Yes, I am here, he will quickly reply. Remove the yoke, heavy yoke of oppression. Stop pointing your finger and spreading vicious rumors. Feed the hungry and help those in trouble. Then your light will shine out from the darkness, and the darkness around you will be as bright as noon. The Lord will guide you continually, giving you water when you are dry and restoring your strength. You will be like a well-watered garden, ever like an ever-flowing spring. Some of you will rebuild the dead, deserted ruins of your city's walls. Then you will be known as a rebuilder and a restorer of homes. I am one of many, many people who have been affected by someone else's drinking or drug use. After years of trying to help my loved ones find sobriety by begging and pleading, using anger, manipulation, I was encouraged to try Adenon. I was so desperate to help my loved ones that I found a local meeting and almost immediately knew I was in the right place. For those of you who don't know what Adenon is, it is a fellowship of people who are seeking recovery from the effects of someone else's drink. It is based on the 12 suggested steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, which we try to apply to our lives, along with the slogans and the serenity prayer. Slogans such as let go, let God, one day at a time, progress, not perfection, and there are so many more. I learned in Amazon that I did not cause my loved one to drink. I cannot control the drinking, nor can I cure the alcoholic. Amazon is not a religious fellowship, but it is a spiritual fellowship. It is open to anyone of any religious faith or of none. It is an anonymous fellowship. Everything that is said in a meeting or member to member is held in confidence for this is how we help one another now. God is very present in our meetings. I have felt the Holy Spirit as people share their experience, strength, and hope. al is all about hope. Our loved ones may never find sobriety, but we learn to find contentment and even happiness whether the alcoholic is still drinking or not. I have received so much help from this fellowship that I can now offer help to others who are dealing with this chronic brain disease. We recite the serenity prayer at each meeting. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. As we close each meeting, we say, when anyone, anywhere, reaches out for help, let the hand of Abaddon always be there and let it begin with me. Fayette Presbyterian sponsors a local fellowship here. It meets weekly, and, and we're so blessed. The church provides this opportunity for people to meet. There are many meeting places 
here on the south side in Georgia, the United States is a worldwide fellowship. The 12th step of Al-Anon states, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we try to carry this message to others and to practice these principles in all our affairs. I'm grateful to God that he led me to Al-Anon and I pray I can help others seeking recovery.
13, <coughs> verses 6 through 9. Then Jesus told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and found none. So he said to the gardener, See here, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree, and I still find none. Cut it down. Why should it be wasting the soil? He replied. Sir, let it alone for one more year until I dig around it and put manure on it. If it bears fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. I'd like to invite our young folks to join me down the front. <coughs> Maybe not. Wait. 
wait for something good to spring up out of us. And it's always amazing when it does. So let's say a prayer again. God, we thank you for the great love that you have for us. And we know that you want us to share that love with other people. And you are patiently waiting for us um, to do good things for others. So Lord, this day and this week, help us to know what we might do, um, even right now, for somebody else that would really make a difference to them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks, Jeff. The winds were howling, the snow was piling up, 
The streets are empty and the few cars that are on the road are going slowly so they didn't slide off. The only place she could think to go was her friend Cynthia's house, but that was four miles away in Brighton Beach. Still, she had to go somewhere, so Cynthia's house was in. Linda climbed on her bicycle and began pedaling through the snow. It was a long, cold journey, but Linda couldn't stop. She had to keep pushing. She had to keep going. Finally, three hours later, she was at her friend's front door. With a shivering hand, she knocked three times. My stepdad just threw me out. She told her friend Cynthia through sobs, I have nowhere else to go. The decision to take her in, of course, wasn't up to Cynthia. It was up to her father, Irving. A semi-retired widower with four children of his own and not much money, Irving lived in a small, cramped apartment barely big enough for his own family. Why in the world would he ever agree to take in someone else's teenage kid? Linda stood nearly frozen in the vestibule while Cynthia explained the situation to her dad. Finally, Irving came to the door. He looked sternly at the drenched young girl, and then he put his hand on her shoulder and he told her something that she would never forget. He simply said, you can stay as long as you want. That was it. Eight words and a hand on her shoulder. But to this day, Linda can summon the intense feeling of relief that those eight words produced. It was like a lifeline to a drowning girl, she says. It wasn't much of an apartment. It was right beneath the elevated subway, so it was noisy all the time and it rattled when the trains went by. They were all cramped in there, and Irving was so poor that he couldn't to pay always for the heat, so in winter often it got really cold. But to Linda, it was home now. Warm, beautiful, wonderful home. When it was time to do laundry, Irving's family washed Linda's clothes along with their own. When it was dinner time, she sat alongside everyone else and shared in the same food. When there were family outings, she was part of the game. No questions asked. They treated me like I was a member of their family, Linda says. They never once made me feel like I was an outsider. Linda wound up staying for a year. And when she thinks about getting kicked out at 17, Linda realizes that things could have gone so much worse for her. She could have fallen in with a bad crowd. She could have ended up on drugs. She might have been homeless, gotten into any number of things. There were so many scenarios in which she saw herself dying before she even turned 21. Instead, a big-hearted man took her into his own home and his own family for a whole year for no reason other than kindness and decency. And that made all the difference in Linda's life. And then Laura wrote about what she had learned from Linda's story. Linda's story helped me understand how opportunities to be angels are around us all the time, she says. But recognizing them is a matter of perception. No one would have blamed Irving if he decided to drive Linda on down the road to the police station or turn her over to DSS and funnel her into the system that cares for unwanted kids. But that's not how Irving perceived the moment. To him, Linda's appearance on his doorstep wasn't an imposition or a problem to be avoided. It wasn't somebody else's problem. It was an opportunity for him and his family to serve. <coughs> To him, Linda's appearance was a chance to say yes. It all depends on how you see the world, she writes. 
Do you see the world as a cold place where you need to take care of yourself first? Or do you see the world as a place that is rich with connections and relationships and opportunities to love and share and grow? More important, which of these two worlds would you rather live in? In our passage from Luke today, Jesus tells a parable about a vineyard owner who gives a fig tree one more year to bear fruit. But if it doesn't, it will be cut down. We are more used to Paul's vision of the fruit of the Spirit and encouragement to put those into practice. Those fruits like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness to others, gentleness, self-control. Those are good things towards which to strive. But Jesus' parable about bearing fruit seems to have a tinge of threat in it, doesn't it? But he certainly makes the point that God is not just hoping that we will make a difference in the world. God expects it. God expects it. Something to remember as we journey towards Jerusalem, the season of Lent. Amen. Please stand for our affirmation of faith. This will be from the brief statement of faith of the PCUSA. We trust in God, the Holy Spirit, everywhere the giver and renewer of life. The Spirit justifies us by grace through faith, sets us free to accept ourselves and to love God and neighbor, and binds us together with all believers in the one body of Christ, the Church. The same Spirit who inspired the prophets and apostles rules our faith and life in Christ through the Scripture, engages us through the word proclaimed, claims us in the waters of baptism, feeds us with the bread of life and the cup of salvation, and calls women and men to all ministries of the church. In a broken and fearful world, the Spirit gives us courage to pray without ceasing, to witness among all peoples to Christ as Lord and Savior, to unmask idolatries in church and culture, to hear the voices of people's long silence, and to work with others for justice, freedom, and peace. In gratitude to God, empowered by the Spirit, we strive to serve Christ in our daily tasks and to live holy and joyful lives, even as we watch for God's new heaven and new earth, praying, come, Lord Jesus. Please be seated. Let us pray. Oh Lord, we learn from stories like children coming to Jesus when the disciples wanted to send them away but he told them to let them come. Or his parable about a Samaritan who stopped to help a hurt man when everyone else hurried by with other things on their minds. Or a story about a fig tree and an expectation that our lives bear good fruit. Lord, teach us your way. Help us to learn that you expect us to, to bear fruit and to make a change. Help us to notice when we might make a difference to someone else. We lift up now those who are already on our hearts and our minds.
where we pray in the name of Christ, who taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debts. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now I invite you all to rise and join us in singing hymn number 307, God of Grace and God of Glory. Give us clean. 